Wake that ass up early in the morning. The Breakfast Club. Morning, everybody. It's DJ Envy, Angela Yee, Charlamagne the Guy. We are The Breakfast Club. We got a special guest in the building. Uh, he's the director of Burning Cane, Philip right. Humans. Welcome, sir. Hey, thank you guys for having me. Now Philip, you, what's up, my brother? You what's directed up, this film up, at 17. Up. Well, first of all, let's find out who Philip is first. Well, we will. Who is Philip Humans? And why does he have the co-sign of the great Ava DuVernay? Ooh, okay. That's a great question. Um, well, I'm a filmmaker from the Seventh Ward of New Orleans. Mm -hmm. uh, I've been making films since I was like 12, you know, 13 years old, short films at first. They were pretty bad until I made my first feature when I was like 17. Uh, it's called Burning Cane, the film that's coming out now. And I made that film with like my best friends in the world, honestly. My producers were my friends that I was hanging out with pretty much every single day. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we made that film over the summer before my senior year of high school. Submitted it to festivals on pretty much the August of my freshman year at NYU. Had to separate, like step away from it. And then found out that the film got into Tribeca and then had to keep that secret for like months. And then when they revealed that uh, in like, I think it was like March of 2019, then... Um, yeah, wipe your brow, my yeah, brother. Yeah, yeah, yeah. See you in here. It's a, it's a little stressful. It's a little stressful. <laughs> it's, a, it's a little hot in here. It's a little hot in here. It's a little bit. Wipe your brow. You be bit. all right. Usually it's cold, but it's we, a we, we I was you. running here too, bro. I was like really booking it, yo. But um, but yeah, so I think, uh, so the film is about, you know, a rigidly Protestant community in rural Louisiana. I grew up in the Baptist church, and there were a lot of things about the church that I sort of, you know, disagreed with, and I separated from the church as I got older. But with Burning Cane, I wanted to sort of approach that community that I grew up in from a non-judgmental sort of objective kind of perspective. Mm -hmm. uh, speaking on some of the things within the church, like, you know, the dangers of enacting a fundamentalist interpretation of religion and the, uh, the sort of pitfalls of toxic masculinity mm. and the jealousy and insecurity that can sort of foster within that. Also, the dangers of the generational, you know, passage of vices and how so often they can pass down from generation to generation when they're normalized. Generational trauma. Exactly, exactly. And also within that whole ethos about how, you know, that rigid interpretation of Protestantism can sort of perpetuate a lot of those things within that circle. Now, how did you get into the game? I've I seen some of your auditions as an actor. Oh, so, so let's talk about that. You started off as an actor yeah, first. Yeah, yeah. I did start off as an actor, but I can't take, you know, one, I think being an actor takes a lot of tough skin, you know, um, and I think wasn't very good at it though that was what I assumed like was my my sort of in mm -hmm. to the film industry when I first started you know but then when I went on the set of this one film that was shooting in New Orleans called American Hero when I first saw like a set at large working like the director and the DP in their conversations were always so much more interesting to me than the conversations that I would have with anyone that I was kind of scene partners with or doing a scene with and so from there I decided you know I want to kind of I really want to dig deep and try some of this stuff on my own um, and then from that point, you know, I started making films that were so much more kind of like thematically reflective of the things that I was working with. You know, I've always kind of been an isolated sort of soul, you know, and so a lot of my films tend to deal with those kind of conversations. Mm -hmm. um, social anxiety, maybe? Social anxiety is, is definitely a real thing, you know. Um, I think as artists, it's so often to be sort of, uh, so often that we're kind of reclusive. I think everyone can kind of know that, but... I think a lot of that kind of stuff I was working out in those films. Because you got to yeah. walk into a room, be forced to talk. Yeah. But you would rather talk to your art. It's probably easier for you to talk to your art. Yeah, it's easier to talk to your art. And it's also less, uh, you know, it's, 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 it's so interesting because I feel like so much about what we say as artists, we can speak through our art. But there's also the point of like art is activism, which is a conversation that I've had with my family a lot. Because like this film, like showcases religious <coughs> figures in an overtly fallible light. My family was like, is very, very, very religious, mm -hmm. you know, and there's still conversations today where we'll have, where they'll tell me like, you know, Philip, you know, you don't need to alienate everybody else, you know, but I also have to like speak my truth mm -hmm. and not be, not live in fear, you know what I mean, of what people will think of my diversion from what I was raised in, you know? Yeah, I think the best, you know, when you said art through activism, like Spike Lee and Ava DuVernay mm. do, do that the best to me. The best, yo, and especially because, yo, when you think about Ava's work, it's 13, Selma, When They See Us, mm -hmm. so much of it really, like, I don't know any filmmaker quite like Ava where their work sparks a literal global conversation. Sure. You know what I mean? Within sure. our community specifically, like When They See Us, a, a fire ran through. Mm -hmm. 13th, that, that's how I, I knew about the 13th. The third, that's, yeah, like, I yeah. didn't, like, I mean, I definitely wasn't taught that in school. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? 
that's so insane to me. And Thirteenth was such a such an illuminating uh, project, and I feel like that's just a hallmark of Ava's work. And well, also, had, she, oh, sorry, sorry, you go, you go. No, oh, go, yeah. go, go. What do you say? I was just gonna say shout out to her because I honestly believe that you know Ava is one. She's just one of the sweetest souls I've met. So I feel so fortunate. It's honestly on some like pinch me type situation, pretty much every time I'm around her, because less than a year ago, I was like thinking and talking to people about like Ava and, and, and then all of a sudden flash a year later, then I'm chilling with Ava. She brought me to the Glamour uh, Women of the Year Awards. That was really fun. I met Yara there. Mm -hmm. All these people that for like seemed so sort of, even you guys, you know, not to blow, not to like be in here sort of like gassing, but like. I love gas. Come on, yeah, give, yeah. It <laughs> give it to me. Give it to me. But like really, but like even this situation, like it's all feels like such a, a wild jump in 360 in a way. But Ava, Ava to me is, is so dope also because despite her, you know, amazing success in her own career, she's still so dedicated to promoting the work of filmmakers of color and women of all kinds. Yes. And especially when you look at like Burning Kane. Like Burning Kane is a story where I was really, really sort of falling back into my own creative instincts, mm -hmm. not really following any sort of, you know, pattern laid out. And because of that, it's not a commercial film in any regard, but Ava still still believed in it, you know what I mean? She still believed that this story was important coming from my perspective and based on the conversations that I was having in the piece. So just shout out to Ava, Array, and all the dope black women that run that distribution company. Now, how did you get into directing? Like, you know, because most people looking at this would be like, well, how did he get into it? It's expensive. How did he get the camera? How did he get the film? Mm -hmm. How did he get the actors to want to do it? Yeah, he made it sound so easy, right? right? Now, I started at 12. I started and then, at 12. <laughs> 17 at the own film. I met Ava. She took me to a couple of places and... Eh. But how did how did you get into it? How did I get into it? Like you're saying, like how did the I the whole shebang? How did got, you, as a person, get to the to the point where you can create Burning Cane with the, the amount of actors and the cameras <clears> and the <throat> rental and the budgets and yeah. financing? It was a grassroots operation through and through. So, uh, in terms of, sh I'm just gonna I'll just walk it through kind of from the sure. beginning about how we've got everything together. So. At first, it started with a short script called The Glory mm -hmm. that I then showed to my professor at the New Orleans Center for Creative Arts, which is the same school that uh, John Batiste went to, Wendell Pierce, Harry Connick Jr., all the Marcellises. Um, John and so, Batiste, that's my guy. Yeah, that's my dude, too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, me and him, uh, we got a, a short doc coming out soon about his time at the Village Vanguard. Oh, wow. There's two records that just dropped. So we, uh, we shot that last December, no, November. But John is, a, is literally like a, a prodigal talent. Like, he's... And also a great dude. Great spirit. Great mm -hmm. dude. Um, and so showed it to my instructor at the New Orleans Center for Creative Arts. He told me that he thought it could be a feature because of how grounded in character it was and of how it felt like it could be made given the resources that I had. Mm -hmm. And so after he said that, I became obsessed with that. And then I, after like a week, I turned out my first draft of the feature length script. Then I went to my homie, Moe's Mayer. I uh, went to his house right after that. And then I said like, yeah, we're going to do this. We're going to make this feature. Um, both of us not really completely knowing what that would entail, but mm -hmm. still feeling like, okay, we're going to do this. And then after that, uh, so I was working at a beignet stand called Morning Call Coffee Stand during that time for a high school job. It was pretty solid considering like you make, it's like a fast business and you make a lot of tips. So I was stockpiling that. I set aside all of my savings, which at the time totaled like 2,500 from Good. My, I have to ask you for numbers. Hey, hey, numbers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, yeah. It was so, it was like in, in roughly like 2,500 there. Mm -hmm. uh, we raised like a roughly 1,500 me and Mo's from Indiegogo. Uh, and we had money coming in sort of whenever I would have shifts there. So, you know, on those shifts, I would make between like 150, 200, depending on how busy it was or how many tour buses were coming into the Benye stand. Mm -hmm. I was stockpiling all of that. And then I got donations from my family, from my mom, from my grandmother, my grandpa, Moses' family. Uh, and so we had just enough to get through production. But we shot... How much? Roughly, to get through principal, like 10, 15,000. So you shot a movie for 10, 15 grand. But you have to... You have to okay, it's like, if you unpack that, there's so much there that, one, I think our age actually was not a detractor at all. It was... When, you, when I look back in, like, retrospect, like, I really think it was a help. And when I, and I say it like this, like... I used to feel like when I was 18, like there was, there was, I felt like I had to make it then when I was 17 because I didn't necessarily know that we would be able to rely on people's goodwill quite in the same way that I would when I was just this kid that they wanted to help out. Yeah, oh, he's so cute. He wants to make a movie. Yeah, you know, I mean, like, you know what yeah, I'm saying? Yeah. Like, it's like, obviously that's not what we thought of ourselves, but we that's were, how people looked that's how we were aware mm -hmm. of that, you know? And we were also shooting in, also, man, the South can be so trusting sometimes. 
like and and I like all and I'm very very happy about that. But it's like some of it is like crazy because I know we couldn't be. Uh, we wouldn't have been able to do the same thing in like New York. You know, yeah, permits. No, Get no, out of here. Permits. Put your hammer down. Yeah. Oh, you're a college student. Let me see your ID. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> absolutely. No, absolutely not. And definitely not for free. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? And so we shot in Thibodeau, Louisiana, in uh, Laurel Valley on an active, uh, not active, of course, but like uh, on a on still a maintained slave plantation. Um, and then, but we got that house for free from a woman named Shannon Benoit who met us through the guy who was supposed to be my DP, but he had to leave because he had a family. Mm -hmm. um, but that's also an interesting story because he ended up giving me his camera gear, uh, which is how we ended up shooting the first half of Principal um, because, again, we wouldn't have been able to afford it on our own. But then when Jacob, his name is Jacob Johnson, he's actually still a producer on the project, uh, but whenever we had to give him his gear back, then my school happened to get a camera called the Black Magic Ursa Mini 4.6K. Mm -hmm. And so really it's a <clears throat> consumer level camera that allows you to shoot gorgeous uh, you know, images in, in RAW and at the time ProRes HQ, they now have a new thing called Black Magic RAW that lets you shoot uh, pretty much with all the same sort of uh, blank palette of RAW with like a tenth of the space. So Black Magic is also one of the only reasons that we were able to do it. I'm not here to sponsor, but like saying in truth. What do you I mean, think... Black Magic, like New Orleans roots, like voodoo? No, <laughs> no man, about? he just said he just told you the, the camera, camera the camera, the camera. You oh, listening? okay, okay, mm -hmm. I am listening, but I'm just like, huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, Go ahead. Black yeah, Magic. The Black Magic. Um, <laughs> uh, and so from then, so we were raising money. Then, uh, then we were casting. The first person that was cast was a woman named Karen Kaya Livers, who was connect. I was connected to. Uh, from my produce, from my producer and instructor and mentor Isaac Webb, uh, Kaya was a line producer on a show called Treme that shot in New Orleans, and then uh, Mr. Webb brought her on because he felt like she could help me with casting and help me sort of bring what was on the page to like an applicable production situation at a w wider scale. Yeah, you got some major actors in there. You don't have no no little guys in there. You got, you have some. Well, you got Wendell Pierce. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How'd you get him? I'm sure you're getting to that. But yeah, 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 yeah. I'll get into it very soon. Very soon. Uh. <laughs> no, no, I'm, listen, I'm loving the story because Absolutely. I love people that put their self on. Because you got all these people that's always like, oh, put me on, put me on, put me yeah. on. You, you put it, yourself, you yourself on, and yep. I'm just trying to connect the dots of how it was done. Yeah, I also think it's so interesting <clears throat> sometimes. I feel like people are so much more, you know, inclined to really sort of help you out when they feel like the train is already moving. Yes, and as opposed yes. To, As opposed to being like, yo, give me the fuel to start this shit. It's more like all right, this thing is going, I'm right. either going to get on or I'm not. It's like when they see you on the side of the road, you know, if you, they see you pushing your car, they're more entitled to, to get out and help you as opposed to just sitting there waiting for somebody yes, to Yes, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. Yeah, I would be more inclined to. Yeah. yeah. So back to Black Magic. Yeah, yeah. So Black Magic. Um, uh, so Black Magic was uh, sort of a consumer-level camera, and it's still a consumer-level camera now, that my school, NOCA, got. Uh, and so from there, I was using that camera to shoot the rest of principal after Jacob needed his gear back. Uh, when we were crewing up, it was pretty much consistently, probably like out of our 21 days of shooting, we had 17 days of principal photography. Uh, probably like 12 of those days, it was just me, my friend Ojo, and Moe's. We were the only crew. And we had talent as, you know, whether it was Wendell in there, uh, Kaya, Dominique, or Braylon. Uh, but it was a very, very skeleton situation. So everyone was wearing multiple hats. Mm. Like I, I wrote, directed, shot, edited, and produced. Ojo was, you know... Producer, first AD, uh, production designer, and occasional boom op. Mose was producer, second AD, boom op, uh, and occasional grip and second AC. And then Ojo would sometimes be first AC, you know. But there was no job on set and there was nothing on set that needed to get done that no one was ever like, oh, that's not my job. That's gonna, gonna help you it. in the future. I think so, yeah. But it's going to also make you difficult because you're going to be one of the people that don't know how to delegate duties. Dude, you yo, want to do that's the whole thing. <laughs> yo, on like, especially because I, I just I just directed a, a music video a few weeks ago for a, a dope uh, artist, uh, and actor, and musician named Leslie Odom Jr. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, it was the first shoot I've ever done where I wasn't also my DP and wasn't also <laughs> my producer. It was easy. It was like, it was like kind of weird because like for the first time ever, ever as a director, I'm going on to set just observing. Like just being able to, at that point, you know, we've done all the shot lists, we've done all of the sort of prior preparation and production, especially in collaborating with the production designer and everybody to build that. So the top, by the time I walk on set, my job is, is, is it's so different. I don't know, it's so different mm -hmm. because it's so much, it's like, it was easily the less, least stressful shoot ever, mm -hmm. just ever, you know? So that mechanism of, but I mean, I feel like every filmmaker, indie filmmaker especially knows what that's like, mm -hmm. having to, 
put on every job because there's no one besides my best friends really that were going to care about this project as much as I was. You know, it's called um, budget and no budget. Yeah, right. True, yeah. true. <laughs> That's true. And you got Wendell Pierce in it. Yeah. How did that happen? Okay, so to morning call. So I was working uh, at that Benny Stan morning call, raising money. I was waiting on a woman named Lula Elzy, who also went to the same high school uh, that I went to. Mm -hmm. um, and so I was waiting on Miss Elzy, uh, and we were just talking about life. She asked me what I wanted to do with my life. I told her I was a filmmaker. I was about to shoot my first feature film that summer. And I was walking her through the story, walking her through some of the roles in the film. And then we got to the pastor. Uh, and then I said, uh, she asked me, what did I think of Wendell Pierce playing the role? And at first I was like, kind of taking it back, like, you know, like, okay, that'd be cool, but and then she texted him right there, and she was like, hey, Wendell, there's this, uh, there's this NOCA student who's shooting his first feature this summer. Uh, he wants you to be in it. And then Wendell was like, all right, give him my email. So I got his email, then I sent him the script, and I was like, hold up, don't read that, because like, it really wasn't, it wasn't the one to read, and then I took a, a week uh, and just expanded his role and wanted to sort of make a, a wider commentary about the sort of mayoral status that pastors have within the Baptist church and within that community. And so I, I, at that point, I was able to build that sort of revolving three of, you know, the character of the pastor, Helen, uh, and Daniel, once Wendell came on. It also allowed me to make that commentary that we see towards the end of the film about, you know, the dangers of enacting a fundamentalist interpretation of religion and following people's words literally. Because mm -hmm. in that community, in our community, you know, there are, the pastor's word is really kind of second only to God. You know, so it was... Uh, it was it was just it was dope to bring Wendell on because he he allowed so much potential for the portrait of the story to expand. How much did you have to pitch to him? Was it just he read it and he said I'm on, or was it you know, well, a couple it, of conversations? Uh, so it was. Um, did he ask you your budget? How much you got, young man? Uh, well, I mean, <laughs> so I'll I'll, I'll say all of that. So um, so the first the first things back and forth were he did respond to the work, but it was also a question of making the dates work because Wendell was like super busy. He was shooting Jack Ryan and a ton of other projects at the time. And so at first, uh, we actually moved into principal photography. The moment that I thought Wendell was going to be the pastor, that was all I thought. Like that was, it was very difficult to separate from that, but we moved into principal without knowing for sure that he would be the pastor. But I wasn't really like padding that up, seeking other people or doing anything. At that point, I was just, just sort of riding with the idea that it was going to work. Mm -hmm. And then, so I was sending days to him. He'd be like, ah, I can't do it. Sending days to him, ah, I can't do it. And then I just wrote this note. I was like, yo, like, it would mean the world to me. Like, I can't see anybody else in this role but you. It would mean the world to me for you to do this. Um, let me know what dates you can do. And I don't care when that is, we'll do it. Uh, and then he sent me some dates and I was like, all right, bet. And that's what we're doing. And what about payment? We took 30% on the back end? Well, no, what we'll think about is Wendell, Wendell is also a producer. So he's a, he's a profit participant. So he's just like all of us, you know what I mean? So in wow. that, yeah. <clears throat> now is the film a critique of the church? Uh, the film is a cautionary tale, I'd say, of, of, of the church and the institution of the church, but not, that's not what the film is about. You know, the film is about the characters in this town, but among that is a, is a sort of direct cautionary tale of a lot of the sort of fallacies and hypocrisies I recognize in the church. Are there still aspects of the, the institution of church that you appreciate? Uh, there are a couple of things, you know, I mean, I love gospel music, you know, I think gospel <laughs> <laughs> Just the music. That's what you got, the music. No, you know, you me say, you know. I like the music. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, no. Look, I do I actually do love gospel music, but um, you know, I mean, some of the some of the most you know loving people in my life, you know, I've met through the church that are still a, a part of my life, you know. Uh, but it doesn't separate the things that I recognize. A lot of the hateful rhetoric, especially a lot of the you know you know rampant homophobia, and a lot of uh, and some of the shaming that can happen within church. You know, sometimes where like people are offering their ties, and like pastor will say, "All right, if you." You put your ties in, wave your envelopes in the air. We don't recognize that that's like a, a visual thing of the people who can't donate are still sitting in their chairs. It's like such a such a subtle thing, but I feel like there are bits and pieces that just sort of that just sort of illuminate the entire underworkings of that process. Um, but it, the the film is not is not in any way a judgmental piece, you know, because I think in the way of humanizing, you can't judge your characters for anything, you know, no matter how sort of vile and messed up some of those things can be. Otherwise demonizing it from the jump. I think if we could separate God from religion, the world would be a better place. Because what I mean mm -hmm. by that is, it has to come a point in our society where we realize 
the Bible is outdated. Mm. It just is. Yeah, no, like, definitely. It's just a lot of it's just like, it's just one of those things that was a part of culture at one point, but it's a lot of things in the Bible that are just simply outdated. So it's yeah. it's a contradiction in a lot of ways. Yeah. Do you consider do you consider yourself religious to this day? No, I consider myself spiritual. Mm. I grew up uh, a Jehovah Witness. Uh, my my mother's still a Jehovah Witness. My grandmother was a Baptist. My father was a witness till he got this fellowship. Then my father got into Islam. Mm. You know, so I'm, I've I've had I've, I've had a little bit of gumbo when it comes to yeah all of my you know religion, religion yeah. and spirituality. But I consider myself a spiritual person only because like I just think it's a lot of contradictions in in the Bible and even some of the stuff you said. You know, uh, homophobia, sexism, racism, yeah. <laughs> anti-Semitism. Like it's just yeah. a lot of things in the Bible that contradict the whole "thou shalt." not yeah. judge yeah. aspect of it. Yeah, no, I, and I agree. What about you, Envy? Are you? Same religious? way, I'm very spiritual. I, I, like I said, I was Baptist growing up, but I went to a Catholic school, so I had to go to Catholic church. So it was kind of confusing, but... They made him wear the Catholic dress, so it was like really confusing for him. Do you believe him? Uh, <laughs> you believe I know he'd be messing with you, <laughs> though, so yeah. <laughs> But very spiritual, but you know it's the same thing with my kids. My one, one, my son goes to Catholic school, but I want them to make the decision and on them on their on their own. Mm. Like I was forced. I had to go yeah. to church every Sunday. I was this, and I had to go to this. So, but but spiritual, but not necessarily religious. It's so interesting. Yeah, like I was brought to church pretty much every Sunday. But uh, in truth, my mother was like super encouraging of us questioning in a dope way that was kind of contrasting to the act of bringing us to church mm. every Sunday. And she's also a producer on this project, though she is religious, you know. And she was just slamming me about that L.A. Times, uh, the headline on, on the online. Uh, I, I, I think it was interesting, you know, but it was like saying, like, uh, Burning Cane is a blistering takedown of the Baptist church. And she mm -hmm. sent me that text. She was like, blah, 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 blah. Even though she knows how she's I feel. She's the EP on the film, though. She's, yeah, no, but I know it. So oh. <laughs> thing about it is my, it's, it's, it's not a black and white thing, mm -hmm. you know, because she recognizes my intentions as an artist and recognizes... That my intention is not to judge, you know, necessarily. Mm -hmm. um, what were some of your first questions about religion? Because I would think that some of those first questions led to some of this film. Right? Yeah, 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 yeah. So, uh, so some of the first questions uh, for me were, I think, one of the first things was like, how come? Why does God want to harden the Pharaoh's heart uh, if He wants the Pharaoh to agree with Him to free the Israelites? You know, mm. like, what's the point of saying that you're going to, you're going to, they have to, you know? put the blood of their firstborn sons on the door, if that's the right sword. I think that is exactly what it is in the passage. You have to put the blood of your firstborn son or to put blood on your door uh, or else he'd kill the uh, firstborn son of every Egyptian. But the thing about it is in that same passage, God says that he would harden the heart of the Pharaoh so they wouldn't be able to agree with him. Mm -hmm. So when you think about it in that way, it's like just a little bit sadistic. Yeah, why would he not want... Mm -hmm. to agree exactly with mm -hmm. but think about is when you ask people those questions and you don't get answers oftentimes it like it's it's such a it's a defensive sort of thing for people but it, i totally understand why when you think about somebody who who's been following something devoutly for their entire life mm -hmm. it is such a difficult thing to reckon with the idea that maybe it's not true or maybe there are so many things about it that you can't answer you know what i mean my first two questions about the bible uh adam first man Eve, first woman. They have Cain, they have a Abel. Cain kills Abel, but then goes off and finds a wife. How? Uh, how? Like if they said if Adam and Eve was the first man and woman, then mm. there's Cain and Abel, how does Cain kill Abel and go off and find a wife? I don't know. Exactly. Then they'll tell you like, oh, it's the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, it was more people. Oh, I'm no, like, they say, yo, yo, like, yeah, huh? yeah, 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 yeah. No, I get what you're saying. Another I question I had, uh, Deuteronomy 14, and I asked, actually asked uh, a brother this when we used to do Bible study. Um, Deuteronomy 14 8 says you shouldn't touch the flesh of a dead pig nonetheless eat it right mm. so I bring that up the brother's like oh if you pray over your food it's okay I'm like okay well the Bible also says you shouldn't have premarital sex mm. so if I pray over the vagina before I sleep with it does that make it okay uh, he has a weird way of thinking that's <laughs> not weird those are questions like these are things how did he answer are... that I'm just curious he didn't answer he told me that there was <laughs> yeah, no hope yeah. he told me there was no hope for me <laughs> he was right <laughs> <laughs> just, you just tossed me away. Goodness I, 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 I guess religion is the original cancel culture, I guess. Yeah, no. Yeah. And in, in, in a lot of ways. <laughs> and there's also some other stuff, you know, about like beards and it's just it's it's a doctrine that was written like a thousand years ago. You know, I think to your point of like things need to be re engineered. I think there's so much about, you know, about the the entire thing that I'm not sure about. And so these days I, I pretty much sort of align and say that I'm, you know, agnostic, sort of atheist leaning because I don't 
really know. But on top of that, let's be real. Like, even though I, I am definitely in that strain of thought, it is definitely bleak to think about. So you understand why people sort of fall back to religion mm. as a sort of emotional refuge. Like thinking about ob oblivion is horrifying. Like thinking about the idea of like once you die, it's, we all cease to be conscious. Yeah. And then it's just a, you know. But there's a question, a part of me, that it's not necessarily bleak, that maybe that's just a part of the natural way of life. Maybe and it's maybe, sleep. Maybe it's sleep. You know, when you're in like that deep REM sleep and you just... Like lucid or something. Yeah, yeah. maybe it's that. I don't know. I don't know. I, I, it's, just, it's just weird. Like the whole concept, even in the Bible, it says you can't find God in a man-made temple. Yeah. But then they tell us to go to the church. They tell us to go to the mosque. They tell us to go to the synagogue. Like, I don't, it's, it's, just, it's just weird. Yeah. It what is. You, it's weird. What do you want people to get out of this film? Uh, I want us to take an objective look at religion and its role in our community. You know, I think it, it perpetuates and promotes a lot of traditionalist, antiquated values. Um, and Burning Cain, you know, when I spoke on toxic masculinity, something that I've also personally experienced and, and you know, and, and the jealousy and insecurity that comes with that in my own sort of relationships. It's something that is uh, touched on uh, and also sort of perpetuated within that ethos of Protestantism by uh, the main character, Helen. Uh, she tells her son that he... Uh, he, no son of hers is going to, you know, let a woman take care of him, you know, is going to is going to then be supported by a woman. And she's a she's an independent, strong woman herself, yet she perpetuates uh, and is and is working against, you know, the progress and sort of upholding those traditionalist gender roles, even if it's not even a conscious thing for her. But she's in a prison of belief in a way, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah, because how do you take care of Oprah if you're a man? Uh, well, I mean, but think about, I, like, I feel like do, what can you do for her? But I feel like at that point, Oprah is probably has been so satisfied materially that she's probably just seeking personal, emotional, relations. spiritual, mental. Yeah. yeah, especially like like I was hanging. I went to uh, and shout out to uh, Kieran and Shifka. I was at uh, her birthday party in L.A. Uh, a few days ago, and she had this whole thing. Like Kieran's been super successful. Like she was on Mad Men. She's got her friends are like w in wild places. They're all doing really well financially mm -hmm. to the point where Kiernan is just about hanging out with people. She's like, don't bring any presents, like no presents to this, you know, and it makes so much sense, you know, because at that point when things are mat satisfied materially, like what is there to sort of get yeah. except human relationships, except right. people. Right. You Your know? mom was in the EP on uh, Bernie Kane. How'd you get her to do it if she's so into the church? It's so, it's crazy, yo. It's I'm telling you, it's not black and white at all because she is still religious, still has her issues with those kind of things, but she has always been about promoting me as an artist, always been about, you know, what I'm driven behind, and she knows that my intention with this, you know, I didn't write the headline, I don't write things like that, you know what I'm saying? It's, even though I speak my truth, I say how I feel, you know, it has never been, the objective of this project was always to, to create a story, a character-driven sort of documentarian-like story about these people in this town. Mm -hmm. It's cautionary and bleak because of how I feel about the things discussed, but it is not defined by, you know, me sort of casting out a damnation of religion and the people that follow it, you know. What but, advice did a Ava DuVernay give you? Ava gave me some great advice as we were ramping up for the release of the project because, um, so I've been since i how I've, did you meet her too? Uh, what'd you say? Both, and how did you meet her? Okay, so, all right, so let me, so let me start there, how I got with Ray, and mm -hmm. then I'll just, because the advice, it leads in. Gotcha. Um, so... I was, uh, it was after Tribeca, um, and we, when I first heard that uh, my team was in talks with Array, then I was like, then I decided, all right, it's Array. Uh, because of the fact that they are so dedicated, like I said, to promoting the works of filmmakers of color and women of all kinds. And so after that, I wrote a note to Ava and Tulane, pretty much outlining that I felt like our intentions as artists are the same in that, you know, I'm dedicated to promoting the work of uh, you know, of sort of nuanced humanizing stories of the black experience, and it's very very clear that that's Ava's objective as well, uh, and that's what I outlined in there. And then I wrote, left my number. I said like, yo, I'm around. Hit me up whenever. Just like sending it out on the chance that like she would see that and feel like, okay, this is cool. And so then like a note, note like on like paper. A note. Well, not like a not like a note, 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 because I didn't know when that like email. In. Yeah, an email. Okay. Yeah, yeah. To uh, <laughs> <laughs> say like, oh, I just like. Yeah, I was like, the wow. time. You're like, yo, that kid is Just thorough. Under yeah. the door. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, but so so I sent that to them, and then I was at actually Bope's Library over at NYU, mm -hmm. uh, and I got a call. It was like a it was like a an LA number three two three or three one zero, and 
I was like, okay, let me just check. I had a feeling like, oh, this could be Ava. And then she said, hey, Philip, it's Ava DuVernay. And I was like, oh, snap. Look, I'm in a library. Let me call you back in 30 seconds. You said call her back? Out yeah, of the goddamn door, millennials. Are you millennials kill me. Let me call you back. I would have been like, hold on, hold on. Call you back? I said, I said, I said, I said, like, my first reaction was, oh. And I was looking around, and I'm around people, like, stacked around me, like, hard, hard studying. So I'm like, oh, let me call you back in 30 seconds. So I said, grab my shit, ran out. I was like, Ava, Ava, Ava. And then we like talked about everything. Are you bugging? When she might not say, you know what? I'm not answering my phone. <laughs> yeah, and I'm not even going to put that on millennials. You're not a millennial. You're a generation Z, right? I think so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Then what's the millennial? Millennial is like, ugh, don't get me relying. I think it's like 20 something to 38 or something like that. Oh, okay. Not 20, 20 something. But I yeah. think you're generation Z. Gotcha. Let me gotcha. Google that to make sure. Yeah, because I'm actually interested in that because mm-hmm. I know that sometimes. I, we've sort of been grouped all in the same, same sort of thing, yeah. So, so, you, ran, so you ran so, outside. So I ran outside, and then she was talking to me about. She's like, "Hey, Philip, we're going to we're going to make an offer to dis- distribute your film," and I said, uh, "Well, amazing! I want you guys to be my distributor." And then we started talking about. She asked me what my intention with this piece was. She said, "Oftentimes, filmmakers will say, oh, my intention is, you know, to to spearhead award season, to do all that kind of stuff,' but." My whole thing was just I wanted the film to start a conversation, an objective sort of conversation within our community mm-hmm. about religion's role, mm-hmm. whether it is sort of sort of a part of our advancement or not, right. you know? Uh, that's touchy. Uh, Generation Z is between 95 and 2010. You're born between 95 and 2010, Generation Z. Mm. But it's touchy what you said about religion because I think that religion uh, initially was meant to control. But it also gave those same slaves that were being controlled Hope. Dude, I, it's 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 not a black and white thing. Yeah. Yo, it's not a black and white thing because I mean, as as a people, we didn't come over here as Christians, mm-hmm. you know. But um, but like I said, it's again just rec- acknowledging the nuance is the only way to approach something in a humanistic way. Like saying I I fully acknowledge how it is an emotional refuge and it gives people hope. I've always been super aware of that. And there was a time in my life where um, I was kind of sort of leaning back into it but then I recognized again that it was all just fear because in truth when I was like 12 or 13 like okay look I started questioning this stuff when I was like six seven eight years old Mm -hmm. all right still going to church every Sunday pretty much being an outspoken honestly rude kid about it for the longest whenever I didn't get answers to questions I was pretty outspoken and we would always end in, in arguments usually when I was like 12 or 13 then I started like honestly being fearful because there was an idea in my head that I was literally going to burn in the pits of hell if I did not sort of bring myself back to that. Mm-hmm. And I was being reminded by, you know, honestly, by people around me, by members of my family that, like, you know, the only way to really be saved is to really give your life to Christ. And in that way, I was just, I felt like I was living in fear straight up, you know, because I was praying, praying every day, multiple times a day over every little thing, just like taking it to an extreme whenever, like, fear really, really struck. Mm-hmm. That stuff is exhausting. Yeah, you know what I'm saying. Like it's, I just, uh, I don't know. But I, I think, look, I can fully acknowledge why people sort of fall into that, and why it's meant so much to people for so long. But I also think it's important because I'm, I'm, I'm done with telling people how to believe. I can only speak my truth mm-hmm. and then put that out there, uh, and 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 just sort of just start the conversation. Because at the very least, I think it's worth an objective look. Only uh, thing I know for sure is that there's something bigger than all of us. I don't know what that something is. Yeah. You know, whether you call it God, I always use the acronym for God, G-O-D, gain your own definition. Mm. But just know that there's something bigger than all of us. And you can just look around the world Mm -hmm. and look at each other as humans and just just life and realize there's something bigger than all of us. I can see that. And it's also like, it could be something cosmic. You know, it could be something... Could something, be something cosmic. On some like universal, like, you know what I mean? Because, I mean, you look outside of Earth. It has and, like, to be it's cosmic, fast, though, You know right? what I'm saying? Yeah, because of the fact that space is also like constantly expanding. Mm-hmm. I mean, there's so much out there. You know, I just, I just, I just, at least for right now, you know, I'm, that's why I fall into that agnostic sort of atheist leading thing because I don't, I don't have any sort of answers right now. I think mostly with my work now, I'm just approaching things with a lot of questions. Right. You know? Um, well, I'm older than you. I'm like generation, uh, M. What year were you born? 78. 78. I'm old. So I I don't want to chance it by saying I don't believe. <laughs> you know, I understand it. I do. I do. I believe in a higher power. I don't want to sit here and act like like there's nothing that doesn't exist that created 
all of this. Right. I understand. You know what I'm saying? I understand, yeah. And it's, especially there's also some things in life that's like, yo, the coincidences or like things like sometimes things can feel like, yo, that's that's uncanny, mm -hmm. you know, but but then then but that's why I say cosmic instead of like putting it maybe necessarily into some sort of like, you know, gender deity, you know, it's got to be both, though. Right. Like, I believe I've been studying uh, the sacred masculine and the divine feminine mm. lately. Right, I haven't read it. I, I know, isn't there? A, isn't there? A, There's a great book called Soul of the Superior Man, and it's another book I'm reading now called The Thirteen, The Thirteen Original Clan Mothers, mm. and it's about uh, discovering the gifts, talents, and abilities of the feminine through the ancient teachings of the sisterhood. So it just talks about the divine, feminine, and, and sacred masculine traits that exist within all of us, because that's where you need to balance, right? Like when you have, I think toxic masculinity comes into play when when you have too much masculinity, mm. right? So all of the traits that go into the sacred masculine, when you're leaning too far into that without having any of the divine feminine to balance it out, that's when mm. it becomes toxic. So it's just got it's got to be both. Like whatever the creator is has to have both energies, right? And is, is, does the book all just feel like there's a there's an a, an appropriate or not appropriate or like a, a and a sort of an, an amount of amount of both of those traits within all of us? Yeah, yeah, no yeah. Matter no no matter the, no matter the gender. Uh women have just as much Sacred masculine and men have just as much divine feminine, but it has to be a balance. Yeah, I guess of you. both. Now you never you never mentioned what Ava DuVernay uh, what advice she gave you. Oh, okay, oh. got you, got you, got you. So getting into that. Um, so as we went on with that conversation, I outlined you know that I wanted to visit HBCUs and I went to Spelman, which is actually really dope. Mm -hmm. um, and then I'm going to go to hopefully uh, take the film also to Howard. Um, but so Ava. Okay, the, the, the advice that she gave me was sort of essential when, around the time when we were building marketing materials for the film at Array. Because I went to it, I was like, oh, I cut the trailer, I had done all that stuff, I had made a kind of poster concepts. Uh, but I didn't realize, and this is a big thing about being your own writer, director, mm -hmm. you know, editor, all that kind of stuff, uh, is that you're so attached to every little thing, you know? And I think I had to hear it from Ava to know that, yo, it's okay sometimes to sit back, separate, and let people do their job, you know? Because there are, pe there are people who's, especially working at Array, whose dedicated job is to do marketing materials because they've done it successfully for their careers. Right. And, you know, and for me, even though this project came from such a grassroots sort of, uh, sort, of in, sort of way, you know, so I felt like, you know, I've been, for a lot of stuff, especially after production, really it's just been me that's accountable for a lot of it. Um, and so to that point, you know, I... I I was so attached to every sort of poster concept they have, every trailer concept they had. And then until I saw some of the stuff that they had, then it sort of opened my mind to it. But I was at first still sort of, you know, like, blah, 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 blah. Right. you know what I'm saying? But in truth, that just added so much more stress to my life. When I stepped back and really let them do their thing, something beautiful came out of it. Like the poster that they came up with is so sick. Mm -hmm. Like it's probably so, it's so much doper than anything that I could have thought of. And it was also so interesting. One of the things that they did they switch the perspective, which I'm like, yo, only someone who's dedicated, who's, who actually deals with that kind of graphic art on the regular right. would have the sort of skill set to say, okay, how do we change this up in a dope way? Let's literally switch the perspective, you know? Like, that's because some people do what they're born to do and some people do what they have to do out of necessity. Mm. When you was doing a lot of that stuff, it was out of necessity. Yeah. But, you know, that ain't technically what you're born to do. I get you. And that makes so much sense. And that was one thing that... that uh, that Ava definitely taught me, and I do do appreciate that so much. Also, I think in Ava has just laid out a, an incredible precedent. I think amongst us as Black filmmakers, of like really, really, I think anyone who comes up through Array, anyone who recognizes the work that Array does, is now incredibly motivated to continue that legacy of like, you know, there are, there are young filmmakers in New Orleans now. Uh, you know, shout out to a kid named uh, Josh. Um, he's a, he's a young Black filmmaker you know, working on his films. Uh, and it's just really sort of realizing how much Ava has done for me it really makes me look back and want to say like, all right, when as soon as I can, I should go back into New Orleans and really sort of kickstart that also, you know, or kickstart some sort of program, some sort of, you know, master classes, fellowships, sort of grant organizations and workshops that can also help, you know, young filmmakers of color coming out of where I'm from. Are you still in school? Uh, technically still enrolled at NYU. But uh, I'm really sort of mode. I just I'm I'm gonna work on my next feature, my next film. Gotcha. You know, he's 19, 19 years old. One nine. That's right. You know what you was doing at nineteen? Wasn't this? 
I don't remember no, not even close no, to this. No, because I was high. I was All probably right. in school <laughs> okay. doing Jesus stupid Christ, ish. Jesus Christ, Well, congratulations, man, and good luck yeah, with congratulations. everything. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Congratulations, we appreciate and much you success for joining to us. You. Absolutely. Hey, What's you, your man. next film? What's your next feature? You, you think uh, you know? Yeah, my next uh, narrative feature is about the New Orleans chapter of the Black Panthers in 1970. I got to know those Panthers early on in high school. Mm-hmm. Uh, and How the hell did you get to know all oh, that? They was old then. Well, yeah. so I was, uh, I, I went to this uh, this screening at the Ashley Center for Cultural Arts in New Orleans. And then afterwards I met those Panthers and I started visiting them like after school. And at first, when I first met them, I was like sort of enamored, thought they were like these just super badass, enigmatic, like revolutionaries. And they, and they were, you know, but then I got to know them more as people and sort of recognize what made them human and sort of nuanced and multidimensional and what some of the things that they were struggling with at the time, you know, stuff that they sort of let me in on as I was, uh, as I spent time with them. So yeah, you know, that film is about, you know, the, you know, the communal inner workings of the New Orleans chapter, you know, how they were, you know, working for their community despite the sort of de facto Jim Crow that was so prevalent in the city at the time. Mm -hmm. Uh, But it's another, it's another story, you know, that I'm dedicated to providing a humanizing lens to, especially because the Panthers and their work in the community has been so demonized for so long. A lot of people don't even know New Orleans had a chapter, but it's in, in, it's kind of understandable to see why, given how, like I said, how, you know, how de facto Jim Crow, though it wasn't de jour, it wasn't in law, there were still sort of white only signs in the city. Uh, and the Panthers are such an unapologetically pro-black, uh, you know, movement. Sort of, yeah, movement and, and, and community that, you know, there's just, uh, there's just a lot there. So I'm, I'm, I'm excited to get to work on that for sure. Dope. And when when, when Burning Cane come out? This Friday, right? So uh, so Burning Cane is uh, is playing in select theaters across the country and currently available on Netflix. And I want to say, uh, if you are happen to be in Los Angeles this weekend, go to the Getty Center. Uh, the amazing Solange Knowles is uh, curating uh, Bridges, a selection of short films and performances. Uh, and my first narrative short for her creative agency, Saint Huron, is premiering uh, in that uh, at the Getty Center in that exhibit. Dope. Oh. So Burning Cane's on Netflix right now. On Netflix right, right now. now. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for joining us, bro. Hey, thank you guys yeah, so man. much Good for having you, me, man. It's Philip Humans. It's the Breakfast Club. Good morning.